So now I want to take a little time out to talk a little more about optical activity. So we talked earlier that light has an orientation. I want to expand on that a little bit. So it turns out associated with electromagnetic radiation is an electric field. So that is a vector pointing in a certain direction. And then there's a magnetic field that is also a vector and points in the perpendicular direction. And then perpendicular to both of those is the direction of propagation, or sometimes we say the velocity as well. So and for any given direction of propagation, this electric field could be, you know, 360 degrees all the way around. So oriented in any way, shape or form. And when the, you have all those different possible orientations present, we call that unpolarized light. But you can shine it through a polarizing filter. This is kind of the basis of polarizing sunglasses. If you shine, it, shine light through a polarizing filter, it'll block out all the orientations largely except for one. And at that point, you now have plain polarized light. So and it turns out if you shine that plain polarized light through a solution containing a compound that is chiral, so that light's going to get rotated. So and if we kind of take a look here, so we could look at it and we kind of usually call this vertical mark the zero point. So and if it rotates the light to the right, if it comes out right rotated, we'd call that either D or plus one way to identify the isomer. So but if it rotates light to the left, we might call that L or minus. So and the D and the L here correspond to dextro rotatory and levo rotatory, which simply just mean uh, right rotating and left rotating and or plus and minus are commonly used as well And these are one way of designating enantiomers and distinguishing them from each other uh, But we'll more commonly use R and S so we call these relative configurations Whereas the R and the S are the absolute configurations now Whereas you can distinguish R and S from each other based on the structure You actually have no idea which one is rotating light to the right and which one is rotating light to the left until you actually stick it in a polarimeter and measure it. So there's no connection between R and S and D and L or plus and minus. So the only connection you know is that if I tell you that for a certain compound, the R isomer is the L isomer, then you know that the S isomer for that same compound would be the D isomer. So again, if the R isomer rotates light to the left, then the S isomer would rotate light to the right. But until you know one, you wouldn't know the other. You'd have to actually put them in a polarimeter to figure that out. So you should also remember that achiral compounds don't actually rotate plane polarized light. So you take that plane polarized light and sign it through a solution of an achiral compound, the light will come out right true on the zero degree line. Again, it doesn't get rotated whatsoever. You should also remember that a racemic mixture, in a racemic mixture, pure 50, you know, truly 50-50, half the molecules want to rotate light to the right, half the molecules want to rotate light to the left, and on average then the light doesn't get rotated, and so a racemic mixture is optically inactive as well. So it turns out if you take a compound and stick it in a polarimeter, you're going to get an observed rotation. And here alpha stands for rotation. So, and how far that light gets rotated will depend on the concentration of molecules. So the more molecules it comes into contact with, the more it'll get rotated, as well as the path length of light. So the longer the solution that the light has to pass through, uh, the more molecules it's going to interact with as well. Uh, so both those affect, uh, play a role in, in uh, the overall rotation. And if you account for all three of those in just such a fashion with this equation, you get what's called the specific rotation here, uh, the alpha in brackets. So one thing to note, and this is tricky, your concentration's got to be measured in grams per milliliter, and your path length's going to be in decimeters. So not the most common units in either case, uh, which makes a great question to come up. And so just such a one is written below here. The observed rotation of a chiral compound is 1.3 degrees with a concentration of 200 grams per liter and a path length of one centimeter. What is its specific rotation? Well, that specific rotation, again, is equal to the observed rotation, 1.3 degrees, divided by the concentration, but not in grams per, per liter, but grams per milliliter. 200 grams per liter would be 0.2 grams per milliliter. So, and then divided by the path length in decimeters, well, not centimeters, and one centimeter, it turns out there's 10 centimeters in a decimeter, so then one centimeter would only be 0.1 decimeters. So, and in this case, we can see that specific rotation is 1.3 over 0.2 and over 0.1, and you'll come out with 65 degrees here for that specific rotation. So this is one of the rare calculations you might see in an organic chemistry class. Some courses, professor just opts to leave this out entirely, but it totally is fair game just in about every textbook you'd likely to see. So something you should be prepared to do. All right, the last thing to address with optical activity here um, is what's called optical purity. So, and we'll take the observed specific rotation divided by the specific rotation of a pure enantiomer. And so 
This implies that you've got at least some combination of two enantiomers together. And if they're 50-50, you should have no optical activity, right? You get a, uh, an observed specific rotation of zero. But if they're not 50-50, whichever one's in excess is going to kind of dominate the solution. That's what this kind of takes into account. This optical purity is a measure of which one do you have in excess and by how much. Uh, and so in this example down below, the rotation, uh, specific rotation of S2 bromobutane is 23 degrees. What is the composition of a mixture of both R and S2 bromobutane with a specific rotation of negative 11.5 degrees? So here we've got negative 11.5 degrees, and we want to divide that by uh, the pure, specific rotation of the pure enantiomer. And in this case, we can see that the S enantiomer is plus 23 degrees, which we can imply then that the R enantiomer would be minus 23 degrees. So and in this case, for the pure R enantiomer. So in this case, we can see that we've got an optical purity of 0.5. So negative 11.5, so over negative 23 is 0 0.5. So and it turns out that that optical purity, 0 0.5, is also equal to what we call the enantiomeric excess. And if we express that as a percentage, we see that our optical purity is only 50% of the pure R isomer, so and therefore we have a 50% enantiomeric excess of R. So what that means is if we take the percent R minus the percent S, we'll get 50%. There's 50% more uh, R than S. So note that's two, uh, one equation with two unknowns. We actually should know also that percent R plus percent S adds up to 100%. So the only two things in there. So if we combine these two, and I'm simply just going to add these two equations together here, and I'm going to get 2 times the percent R, so and these will cancel, adds up to a grand total of 150%. And if you divide by 2, you can see that the percent R equals 75%. So and if the percent R is 75%, then your percent S is going to be 25%. And you can see, yeah, the difference between those two, there's 50% more R. That's what we mean by enantiomeric excess. So you might get some problems dealing with optical purity and enantiomeric excess, this kind of basic calculation. So you really just want to set up a system of two equations. Again, R and S always add up to 100. But you want to find out that enantiomeric excess and know that the difference between the two will equal that enantiomeric excess, which is also equal to your optical purity.